Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. The right to a jury trial is guaranteed in the Constitution. But despite that fundamental right, 95% of criminal cases never see a jury. Instead, they resolve by plea bargain. There is no witness testimony and no public examination of the evidence. Prosecutors and defense attorneys quietly churn out deals behind closed doors. It relieves the pressure on an overburdened system. But is it justice? The plea bargain. We know it's a fact of American justice, but can you imagine where we'd be without it? In fact, without the plea deal, the system would simply grind to a halt. And should that be cause for concern? I'm Sandra King, and on this edition of Due Process, we ponder the hypothetical question. Does the plea bargain promote justice or impede it? And what would happen if every accused were to say, I'm entitled to a trial and I want it? Like what we've seen on Law & Order for years. Unlike in real life, the crime is usually followed by a trial, though an offer may crop up somewhere along the way. Murder one for the mailman, assault one and attempted murder two for Catherine Lansing, and you open up on the cases you know about, life without parole. Murder two for the mailman, assault three for Lansing, 25 to life. No. You make this deal or Mr. Bergstrom and I are out of here. But while cases on law and order tend to find their way to trial, the real deal is just that, a negotiated agreement, a plea deal in lieu of trial in almost every case. You're willing to plead guilty to the offense of criminal restraint. Do you know what that crime means? Yes. All right, and do you know that since it is a third degree crime, it's punishable by a maximum of five years imprisonment in the New Jersey State Prison. Do you understand that? Yes. More than 90% of cases never make it to trial. In some jurisdictions, that figure is as high as 99%. Why are we so willing to waive our constitutional right to a jury trial? The truth is, most defendants are encouraged to take a plea deal because of the sheer volume of criminal cases. If everyone exercised their right to a jury trial, chaos would ensue. People also plead guilty because going to trial is a gamble. If they lose, their sentence can be years longer than if they had accepted a plea deal. Some people accused of crimes are promised probation rather than incarceration if only they plead guilty to a lesser charge. Critics say this process ensnares innocent people who believe pleading guilty is the only way to gain their freedom or keep their jobs or provide care for their children. Mandatory minimum sentences, which have contributed to America's mass incarceration crisis, are commonly used to intimidate criminal defendants into pleading guilty in exchange for a shorter sentence. Well, mandatory minimum sentences ensures that you will get the harshest possible sentence um, under law, the mandatory minimum sentence. And so it shifts power to the prosecutors so that prosecutors can then say to you, well, you take this plea or else you're going to get this harsh mandatory minimum sentence. Um, and it gives prosecutors the power um, to, you know, encourage plea deals. Um, you know, in the federal system, I think 97 to 98 percent of all, you know, charged cases result in a plea, not a trial, because people are terrified of facing these harsh mandatory minimum sentences. And it ensures that it's up to the prosecutor, not the judge, um, you know, what kind of a sentence you receive. And mandatory minimum sentences has a lot to do with the exponential increase in our prison population in the United States. Um, and today, you know, even in this era of Obama, in this time of supposed colorblindness, um, we now have created a system of mass incarceration, a penal system unprecedented in world history. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. Um, and the majority of the increase um, in incarceration in the United States have been among impoverished people of color who, once they're swept into the system, are then stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. While plea bargains can be a path to a shorter sentence, many members of the public decry them as unfair. 
It's a story that's sparking outrage across the country and not just from animal rights activists. It just sounded like a, a very extreme case of animal cruelty. I'm just astonished that this would happen here in Colorado. Meet Jason Lewis. He heard about Stewie's animal cruelty case online. How Robert Heckman recorded himself trying to drown and strangle this at the time 13 week old kitten. Something about this particular case rubbed Jason the wrong way. In this case, our number one priority was one to seek justice for what has done and then also to improve the life of Stewie. Unless the judicial system actually takes this seriously and he gets put away uh, behind bars, it's a joke. So he decided to petition against the proposed plea deal by personally delivering 1,500 signatures on behalf of the Pueblo community. And I felt it was just important to come along here today to the DA's office and show that there are a lot of people here who think that he should be off the streets. He should not be able to just walk away from this. Joining us on Justice Matters are Matre Benami, who is the Assistant Legal Director at the Northern California Innocence Project at Santa Clara Law School, and Stafford Professor George Fisher, who has written a book about plea bargaining titled The Triumph of Plea Bargaining, A History of Plea Bargaining in America. Now, I want to start with uh, you, George. Tell us a little bit about the history of plea bargaining. Uh, how did it come to be? So the, the two things that are most important to know about the history of plea bargaining are that it's old and that the causes that gave rise to it are just about what you might expect. So plea bargaining, we speak of it as though it's somehow a new phenomenon that's taken over our justice system, but the first rise of plea bargaining in America goes back about 175 years. And by about 100 years ago, or certainly 90 years ago, plea bargaining had pretty much taken over the system. There's a fairly famous Law Journal article from 1929 called The Vanishing Jury, where the author, who was a Columbia law professor, was talking about how jury trials had, by that time, pretty much vanished from the American scene, more or less around the country, in rural jurisdictions and urban jurisdictions. And what gave rise to it is just about what you might expect. Overworked prosecutors is the main cause, the main driving force behind the rise of plea bargaining. But along with overworked prosecutors, overworked trial lawyers, and then once public defender offices appeared in the early 20th century, about 100 years ago now, they were big proponents of plea bargaining as well, partly because they were overworked and partly because their funding sources wanted to see that they were playing a what, what their funders regarded to be a constructive force in the justice system. And one aspect of their constructive contribution to the justice system is that when they had guilty defendants or defendants they regarded to be guilty, they pled them out. So by the early 20th century, 100 years ago, the judges, the prosecutors, defense lawyers all saw a good reason to plead cases away. And by that point, the end of the trial system as it had been known was pretty well accomplished. You know, Matreya, one thing that is interesting to me is that innocent people sometimes plead guilty. And in the Innocence Project, I mean, you've seen this. Uh, there were recently, I think, a study that showed out of 237 people exonerated by DNA, there were 12 people who actually pled guilty. Now, why would somebody who is innocent uh, decide to plead guilty? There are a number of reasons why that can happen. Um, we have an example out of our colleagues at the California Innocence Project, Brian Banks, um, who is a, a pretty recent exoneree in the last few years. He was facing a potential life term for a rape that had a kidnapping allegation because he supposedly uh, transported the victim of that crime a small distance at a high school. Um, he the case was based entirely on her testimony that he had raped her. He always claimed he was innocent, that he had never done so. And years later, she ended up admitting it um, and ultimately admitting it to the police and the prosecutor. Um, and he was exonerated by a joint motion of uh, the California Innocence Project and the district attorney's office. Um, but that he was facing a life term and he ended up serving, five, I believe, five actual years in custody and was still on parole at the time of his habeas corpus petition and would have had a lifetime sex offender registration despite being factually innocent. But the pressure on him was tremendous because the evidence against him cons consisted of the testimony of this high school girl that he had raped her. Um, that, so the evidence can look really bad. It's, 
terrifying yeah, when you're facing that and your attorney, right. uh, whether or not the attorney believed him, I've never spoken with that man's trial attorney. Um, there's a huge amount of pressure. I've been a trial attorney. If I were faced with that case, I, I wouldn't know exactly what to do. You certainly, um, there's very limited opportunity to defend aggressively in a case like that. Um, there's not that much that investigation can do. It was based on a lie. But there are other cases that, you know, that are not quite so black and white, but that people plead guilty. And the, among the reasons are, um, there's only, you know, I, I don't know the exact number right now, it's a small number of actual guilty pleas by DNA exonerees. There's a larger number of false confessions by known DNA, DNA exonerees. Now that's when somebody falsely confesses to a crime even though they're right. innocent. Where they, la they later get exonerated completely by DNA evidence and it's about 25 percent of the DNA exonerations and we talk about DNA exonerations because they are the ones in which the evidence that the person convicted was innocent is so compelling that essentially everyone agrees they were innocent. So they're very useful for us to talk about the causes of the wrongful conviction. And when you have 25% of those cases where there's a false confession or a false admission, then you have to look broadly at the cases around the country in which there's a false confession or a false admission and there isn't going to be DNA that proves that the person was innocent those people are much more likely to plead guilty. They've already given almost the most damning evidence that you can have at a trial, their own admission that they committed the crime or that they were somehow connected to the crime. And that's people that we know were innocent. So think about um, the people out there that we can't prove because they pled guilty. That means there's no trial transcript. It's almost impossible for us in an innocent project to get access to the original police reports in those cases because if the defense attorney doesn't still have a file, we don't have a right to discovery of those police reports, so we don't necessarily know what the evidence of guilt or the potential evidence that would have disproven it was at the time because the person pled guilty. And the only transcript is of their guilty plea, and that only focuses on them waiving their constitutional rights at a trial. Right. Now, uh, George, what are the advantages of, of plea bargaining to the system, to prosecutors and defense attorneys, and to individuals who are pleading guilty? Is there an advantage? I think there's an advantage to everybody in the system, and that's why it has taken over the system. For prosecutors, it's the most clear advantage. Prosecutors are overworked. A plea bargain is a very quick end of, to a case that could take up weeks or months of a prosecutor's life, and it's a quick victory. So those prosecutors who are counting victories, and unfortunately many do, can add that to their list, of, to their tally of victorious cases. Defense lawyers are overworked, too. I'm sure you know this better than I do. Is, somebody who runs a defense uh, office, a public defender's office, where lawyers are, are straining uh, to cover their clients' cases and to give every client justice. And here's a client who's got very little prayer to be found not guilty at trial. The evidence is very clear. It's very easy for that defense lawyer to say, I'll put my time in a case where I actually have a chance of victory and not in a case where I'm sure to lose. And for defendants, a defendant gains some measure of control. For Mr. Banks, whom Matreya was, was describing, here's a man who's looking at a young woman who's prepared to testify against him, who probably seems like a truthful person. The problem in his case is not that there's plea bargaining, and that's such a horrible institution, but that trials are imperfect. And he looked at his risk of an acquittal at trial, and he may have said, I'm an innocent man, but if I'm found guilty at trial, I have no control over the sentence against me. It could be anything up to life in prison. But if I plead guilty, I can control my sentence. And that, that, was, that is where I'll put my chips. You can see why a person would make that judgment. The problem is, is not that plea bargains exist. It's that our system of trials is imperfect. And trials don't deliver justice perfectly. Jurors don't see the truth perfectly. Sometimes plea bargains are abusive, but often they are a rescue line to somebody who otherwise is about to lose complete control over his life, and this is some measure of control that the, def that the defendant can claim. Now, Matreya, I mean, you, you were a trial lawyer, and w one of the things, I mean, you're facing uh, a crime, it's charged by the prosecutor. They decide what, what charges to bring, and overcharging is something that uh, is, is symptomatic, where the prosecutor is going to charge you with the most serious charge. So maybe you did do something, but it's not what you're charged with, and you're facing uh, a life sentence, uh, and they offer you uh, two years in jail or three years in jail. 
Um, there must be tremendous pressure uh, to take those kinds of, of deals. What can we do to prevent uh, false uh, guilty pleas? Well, I think it's really difficult for me to um, have, that's such a broad answer. <laughs> that question is very broad. Um, if in the situation you're talking about where someone is able to get a, a short sentence, I think that um, George has already indicated that that puts some measure of control back in the defendant's hands. In innocence work, we only represent people who are serving long sentences, and the reason for that is because it takes so long to prove a case in post-conviction. It's such a difficult task to investigate it, and then litigation is often very, very lengthy due to the nature of you know, post-conviction. They and years. go on for years, and that's after you've found evidence, which can often take years, and that's after you've been reached by a client who maybe doesn't know about you for years that they've been in prison. So we have a policy decision that we only take long sentences because otherwise we wouldn't have time to complete them. Right. So I wonder often about the number of people who are innocent but have pled guilty to sentences of 10 or 12 years um, that for, you know, for substantial crimes, but they got what seemed like a, a good offer right. in light of the potential exposure of 10 or 12 years, but are factually innocent, I'm never going to even see those people in an innocence project, which is kind of heartbreaking to me. So how do you, in light of that, how do you address the issue of flea bargaining? I mean, that is where the systemic problems come in, mm -hmm. in terms of the power imbalances, the lack of resources to adequate investigation. San Francisco is better situated than most defense communities and public defender offices in terms of having some resources to do a real investigation, but they're still overburdened lawyers. And when you're in that shape, you it's been my experience that you sort of have to do triage. And you have to take the cases that have some hope of a better outcome. If you have what looks like a great offer, even when the client is saying that they're innocent, it's very difficult to counsel them. It's their choice, ultimately. But it's very difficult to counsel them to reject 10 years when you think it's highly likely they will get life. It's like gambling with your life in right. Las Vegas. Right, and you're gambling with your client's life right. if you tell them, oh, this is a good thing to do. So it's a really tough question. I mean, I think it's a great issue for you to be exploring. <laughs> yeah. So what if people just put their foot down, George, and said, I'm going to go to trial in every case? And I, I recently traveled to Japan and spoke to the uh, Bar Association there, criminal defense attorneys. In Japan, of course, they don't have the amount of crime that we have here, uh, but every case goes to trial. They do not allow plea bargaining in Japan. What would happen in this country if everybody exercised their right to a trial and said, I'm going to trial, I'm not, I'm not taking a deal? So I, I think the most likely consequence is eventually that plan would break down. You've heard of the classic prisoner's dilemma, and the prisoner's dilemma depends on prisoners holding tight to their plan and each of them sticking to the deal, but where each of them knows if I, if I am the one who breaks the pledge, I will profit from it and everybody else will suffer. And I think what would happen in the short term is the jails would become very crowded because defendants would be awaiting trials and the trials wouldn't be happening. Civil trials would end almost completely because the judges would reallocate resources to the criminal side. Criminal trials would go on. They'd, be, they'd go on faster than they do now because judges wouldn't be doing civil cases and they wouldn't be taking criminal pleas. And one by one, defendants would be taken from the jail and put on trial. And those defendants who never had a prayer of acquittal the ones who were found taped on camera, walking into a convenience store, no mask, ripping somebody off at gunpoint, walking out again, there it is on tape, here's the, the cashier willing to testify. That case never should go to trial, but that person's going to have to go to trial now and will be convicted and will be sentenced very harshly because the judges, whether they should or shouldn't, will come down hard on those defendants who finally make it to trial as a lesson to all those who are holding out and eventually the system will break down because those defendants who are sitting in jail awaiting trials where they're going to face that judge at sentencing are starting to call their lawyers saying, I want to plead out and get a deal now. Mm. I think we'd be back where we are. Maybe a year later, maybe six months later, I don't think it would hold out very long. Mm. Matreya, we've talked about the need to reform our bail system because it's based on money, the amount of money you have. Uh, you can be Bernie Madoff and be out on bail because you can afford it. Uh, whereas if you can't post $500 or $1,000, you will be in jail until your case is resolved. How does the bail system um, 
create problems in, in terms of, of plea bargaining? Does it put more pressure on people who can't post bail uh, to plead guilty? Well, it absolutely does. Um, I think it, the impact is more obvious. I'm speaking from my experience here. It's not something I've studied, but on, on shorter sentence crimes, I mean, misdemeanors, and when you're in counties where they hold misdemeanants in custody pending a trial, almost all of them will prefer to get out today and plead guilty um, to staying an additional 30 or 45 days to have a jury trial. And that and prosecutors is, and judges probably know that. Right, absolutely. And that is completely without uh, any regard to the strength of the evidence against them. That is purely a matter of, of wanting to get out, get back to work, get back to your children, get back to whatever it is that they were doing, um, and not want to sit in jail for a period of time. Then, you know, there is a similar pressure on on defendants of whatever the crime that is charged. Um, I don't know how much impact it's had on actual innocence cases, again, because most of the cases that any of our projects have done are long sentences. They typically are violent crimes, so murder, sexual assaults, armed robberies. Um, and many of those defendants do not get bail even if they have a lot of money, but those charges are absolutely disproportionately levied against poor people. Um, cases that might not have resolved, not have involved a criminal charge at all, sometimes end up in charges for people who are poor, people of color. I'm thinking of the no crime cases. Um, for example, um, an allegation that an infant death was caused by some action of the parent or the caregiver. There is a certain amount of um, benefit of the doubt that is given to um, white middle class people in a case like that where there is the initial thought is that such a person would not kill their child. And yet, almost identical facts can be presented where the infant is the child of a poor person of color and they are much more likely to be referred to a criminal investigation, at which point you start having those medical findings, very questionable, that support a criminal charge. And those people are put under huge pressure. I know that you're talking about bail, but you're less likely to get bail on a case like that and again, the facts, the strength of the evidence of the crime can be absolutely the same, but that's going to disproportionately impact the poor and people of color. I definitely have seen that in our cases. We have a case in which one of our attorneys is providing support to the trial attorneys in a trial level case on an infant death. And those clients have hired counsel and they are out on bail and it is enabling them to put on the appropriate defense to these absolutely right. unsupportable it, it, it's a huge criminal charges. It's an absolutely huge out advantage. Of jail. And this is an innocent this is my opinion based on the evidence in this case that these people are innocent and that ultimately the case probably won't even go to trial, but they have been pending trial for years and the only reason that they're able to hold out in this way is that they're home with their other children. And um, that is a clear demonstration that the class, and these people are not white, but they have a class issue that protects, they're, they're protected. You know, right. They have enough money to care for themselves and their children, and they're not in, in jail pending. Right. And this is you know, it's a murder charge, so they would oh. have been in custody if they were poor people. Right. Now, now George, there was recently uh, a number of studies that came out around plea bargaining. Uh, one out of New York, the Manhattan DA's office, where it showed that uh, African Americans and Latinos uh, were more likely to get higher plea bargains. In other words, that prosecutors tended to give certain ethnicities uh, worse offers than their white counterparts. Do, do you think this happens, and why do you think it happens? Do they have, you know, one offer for an African American, another for a white person? Back in the 1980s, when Congress authorized the federal sentencing guidelines. One of the big arguments behind the notion of having strict guidelines that constrain the sentences that judges will be able to give out at the end of a case was that racism seeps into the system in lots of places. Uh, it seeps in through prosecutors' eyes, seeps in through judges' eyes. I think uh, what to, uh, Mitreo was just suggesting is true, that people look at people who look like themselves and see less criminality than when they look at people who don't look like themselves. Um, Unconscious racism is, is a fact. It seems to be pretty clearly demonstrated. There is racism in the system. That's not an argument, though. It's not an argument that persuades me that plea bargaining is the problem because jurors are people, too, and jurors carry their prejudices into a trial just as prosecutors carry their prejudices into a plea bargain. And when a defendant of color 
looks at what his chances are going to be after a plea where he can control the sentence or after trial where he can't and he knows what stands between him and that post-trial sentence is a jury who doesn't look at all like him. It's not a, an irrational choice on the part of that defendant to say I'd rather take some control and get a lesser sentence now. It's especially not irrational when the evidence is very strong. And in most cases that go that far in our justice system, the evidence is very strong. There are aberrations, there are perversions of justice, but most, most of the time when prosecutors make the decision to take a case through to trial, it's because the evidence is pretty strong. Do we want plea bargains to be consistent? I mean, should they be, uh, like for a certain type of case, you should get a certain offer and that's the way it should be? Or should it be more individualized? It should be consistent in the sense that if it varies from person to person, it does so for a good reason. Not because of the color of somebody's skin, not because of whom you know or where you grew up, but because of the crime you committed and the likelihood you have of being a reformed person at the end of your sentence. Those, there are a lot of factors can enter into that calculation and those factors were all legitimate for prosecutors and judges to consider after a plea bargain. We don't want there to be variation because of race and so when you have a system, say in the federal system today, where the, the proper sentence for a crime as dictated by, at least by Congress and the Sentencing Commission can be identified, then we can say that for the average plea in the average case, there should be a 30 or 40 percent discount from that, from that proper sentence. That would be, I think, a system that at least starts out in a way that might lead to some justice. We, where it's just the seat of the pants judgment of a prosecutor, then I think all sorts of prejudices can play in. Matreya, do you have any ideas on, on how we can fix this problem? Uh, in the, the, the fact that we have uh, people who are being treated differently uh, because of, of their skin color or who they are. And if we are going to have plea bargaining, which it seems like it's here to stay, how can we make sure that it's not being abused? I think everything comes down to cognitive bias if you're going to be talking about um, the disproportionate impact of some on plea bargaining then it, there's so there's so many different aspects to this in terms of innocent people um, guilty pleas are a huge problem in the sense that <laughs> in the sense that um, you almost have no opportunity ever to overturn such a case it's almost impossible to go back and and secure justice for someone who pled guilty in terms of preventing people from pleading guilty wrongfully, um, then we need well-resourced defense attorneys and well-educated prosecutors and best practices among police uh, officers. They need to use proper eyewitness identification procedures. They need to record interrogations. So the causes of wrongful conviction are the causes of wrongful conviction. The causes of wrongful plea bargains are, are related to those same social pressures, um, but it is not a simple fix. And I think that um, I am absolutely with George that I can't imagine a system where you just said everybody's going to stop pleading guilty. I think that would, for, for innocent people, that would be an absolute nightmare. Jury trials where we see that the defendant was innocent and got, and got convicted ordinarily have no, have terrible evidence of guilt, very little, very shoddy. And it's a matter of how the case was done that resulted in a person um, getting convicted. And you can't see that when they've pled guilty. Thank you for being on the show, Matreya. Thanks for having me. And thank you, George. It was a pleasure. It's time for a national conversation on plea bargaining. We need to break from our resigned acceptance of course, guilty pleas and unjust convictions as a necessary evil in an overburdened system. Our constitutional rights are worthy of protection. And that includes the Sixth Amendment right to trial. We'll see you next time on Justice Matters.